Then Naomi started to return to her daughters-in-laws from the country of Moab, for she had heard that in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she'd been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judea. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to their mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that you may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they are grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far bitter for me than you, because the land of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said to Naomi, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. The word of the Lord. Beautiful, thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, um, we just ask as we gather in this place that we would be able to set aside the things that are on our to-do list, the things that keep us from you, that we would be able to hear your word, we'd be filled up, and that we would be sent out. We ask this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today, as we um, dive into the book of Ruth, um, today and next week, we're going to split it up into do two different ways. Um, we're going to listen and we're going to hear about, we're going to dive deep into Ruth and Naomi's story. And then next week is going to be kind of more of an overview of God's faithfulness and work in the world, work in the story and in our lives. Today, we're going to um, talk about community and the gift of community and what that looks like and how the community and Ruth is similar and how that works itself out in our lives. But today I have a video for you. It's called, um, it's from the Bible Project. The Bible Project has a bunch of videos that they put out on YouTube, so they're free to watch. Um, but the book of Ruth, we're going to watch part of the video today, just explaining the book of Ruth. I don't know about you, but sometimes we hear Ruth and Naomi's story, but we're kind of struggling to remember what that even meant. And for us to even talk about it, I thought we'd need a starting point. They do a great job of um, talking about those four chapters. But when you, at the end of the part of the video I'm going to show you today, there's a cliffhanger. So, you have to wait till next week. You have to come back next week to hear the, the other part. So you'll see at the very end, it kind of has a weird cutoff because there's more to the video and you have to wait till next week. No cheating and going on YouTube, okay? So we're gonna watch that and we're gonna hear the overview. They do a great job of talking about the overview of the book. If you'd play the video. The Book of Ribs. It's a brilliant work of theological art, and it invites us to reflect on the question of how God is involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of our lives. There are three main characters in the book, Naomi the widow, Ruth the Moabite, and Boaz the Israelite farmer. And their story is told in four chapters that are beautifully designed. Let's just dive in and see how this all unfolds. Chapter 1 opens with this line, in the days when the judges ruled, and it reminds us of the very dark and difficult days from the book of Judges. 
And here we meet an Israelite family in Bethlehem struggling to survive through a famine. And so in search of food, they move on to the land of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy. And there the father of the family dies, and the sons marry two Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. And then the sons, they die too. And so they leave only Naomi and these new daughters-in-law. And so Naomi, she has no reason to stay anymore. And so she tells her new daughters-in-law that she's moving back home. And Naomi, she knows that the life of an unmarried foreign widow in Israel is going to be very hard. And so she compels the women to stay behind. Orpah agrees. But Ruth does not. She shows remarkable loyalty to Naomi. And she says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will become my people and your God will become my God. And so the two of them return to Israel together. And the chapter concludes with Naomi changing her name to Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew. And she laments her tragic fate. Chapter 2 begins with Naomi and Ruth discussing where they're going to find food. And it just so happens to be the beginning of the barley harvest. And so Ruth goes out to look for food, and it just so happens that she ends up picking grain in the field of a man named Boaz, who just so happens to be Naomi's relative. We're told that Boaz is a man of noble character, and he notices Ruth. And so after finding out more about her story, he shows remarkable generosity to her. He makes these special provisions so that the immigrant Ruth can gather grain in his field. And in doing so, Boaz is actually obeying an explicit command of the Torah to show generosity to the immigrant and the poor. Boaz is so impressed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, he prays for her that God will reward her for her boldness. So Ruth comes home that day, and Naomi finds out that she met Boaz, and she is thrilled. She says Boaz is their family redeemer. Now, this family redeemer thing, this was a cultural practice in Israel where if a man in the family died and he left behind a wife or children or land, it was the family redeemer's responsibility to marry that widow, to take up the land and protect that family. So Naomi, she begins to hope that perhaps there might still be a future for her family. Chapter 3 begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan to get Boaz to notice their situation. So Ruth is going to stop wearing clothes of a grieving widow, and she's going to show signs that she's available to be married. And so Ruth goes to meet Boaz on the farm that night. And as she approaches, Boaz wakes up and he's totally startled. And Ruth makes her intentions very clear. She asks if Boaz will redeem Naomi's family and marry her. Boaz is once again amazed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and her family. And he calls Ruth a woman of noble character. It's the same term used to describe the woman of Proverbs 31. So Boaz tells Ruth to wait until the next day, and he will redeem both Ruth and Naomi legally before the town elders. And so the chapter ends with Ruth returning to Naomi, and they marvel together at all of these recent events. In chapter 4, it all comes together. It turns out, at the last minute, Boaz discovers there is a family member who's closer to Naomi than he is, and he's actually eligible before him to redeem the family. But at the last second, this family member finds out that he's going to have to marry Ruth, the Moabite, and so he declines. But Boaz, remember, he knows Ruth's true character, and so he acquires the family property of Naomi, and he marries Ruth. And so just at the beginning, how Ruth was loyal to Naomi's family, so now Boaz is loyal to Naomi's family as well. The story concludes with a reversal of all of the tragedies from chapter 1. So the death of the husband and the sons is reversed as Ruth is married again and gives birth to a new son, granting joy to Naomi. And this symmetry between the opening and the closing, it's even more remarkable. even more remarkable. Now you have to wait to see what's even more remarkable, right? So this did such a great job of explaining these four chapters and what, how this all works and this community and Naomi and Ruth on the road. And so we're going to focus on what that community looks like. But I want to tell you a story first. I was my first, 11 years ago, I was ordained in the beginning of July and I was serving Eastern North Dakota. So Eastern North Dakota, Hillsboro, North Dakota, which is in between Grand Forks and Fargo, they, their slogan was a cup of coffee away, and they were a cup of coffee from 
Grand Forks, or from Fargo. Now, I grew up in Aberdeen, which Aberdeen isn't like a bustling huge town, but it's not Hillsboro, North Dakota. Hillsboro has about 1,200 people in it, right? A little bit different than what I grew up with. And Eric and I moved from seminary in St. Paul, okay? So we moved to Hillsboro, North Dakota to a town of 1,200 and um, the farming community. And Hillsboro is the place that um, the milkman still existed, right? In 2009, you would leave your doors open and the milkman would still come and put milk in your fridges, which we came from kind of a little bit of a ghetto area in St. Paul where you wouldn't even leave anything in your car to leave your doors open. The milkman will come bring milk to your house. So it was a little bit of a different place than we were used to. And so I was there for about a year, and one of the patriarchs of not only the church but the community was passing away. And this gentleman um, had no, he'd never been married before. He did not have any children. Um, He did not have any siblings. So the closest relative to him was his cousin. And his cousin Mary stood about this high, and um, she was also a matriarch of the church and of the community. And so when he passed away, I was sitting at the funeral home with Mary and her daughter planning the funeral. And as we're talking, and you know, I'm, I've now been a pastor for a year, and so you're still kind of trying to figure out what this all means and, and understanding your call. And Mary looks at me, I looked at Mary and I said, hey, you know, what do you think you want for scripture verses? Now, Mary knows her Bible inside and out. She knows everything. And she looks at me and she said, I want you to preach on the book of Ruth for his funeral. And I said, I can totally do that. Because I did not know. I thought, I'll just go read the book of Ruth and understand what she means. So I go home and I start preparing for this funeral and I read the book of Ruth. Now, you just saw the book of Ruth. What does a single, never been married, doesn't have any family members have to do with the book of Ruth? I had over-promised. I had acted like I knew exactly what I was doing and totally confident and didn't ask any questions why she wanted the book of Ruth. I just said, yep, I got this. I didn't have it in the least. Well, I prayed and I prayed and I read and I read and I thought, come on, God, like what in the world does Mary see that I don't see? And then it hit me. Community. This gentleman may have not had a lot of blood relatives. He may not have had a lot of people that were his siblings and married and kids, but this gentleman was not lacking in family or community. That town loved him, and he loved that town. He knew what the gift was of someone going down the road with you. He knew how important it was to care for your neighbor and to be cared for. This book of Ruth is all about community and how we live together, how we support one another, and how our community is a gift. And these days, we are trying to figure out what that means being in person, And we're understanding more and more what it means and the importance of being together. Right? Community. I want you to, we're going to focus for a second on this first chapter of Ruth. So Ruth and Naomi have left Moab and they're on this road. And Ruth and Oprah are with Naomi and she's like, I have nothing for you. Right? Ruth knows that she is older in age. She's not going to find a husband, um, that these women coming with her is probably um, a life of destitution for them. If you were a woman and you lost all of the men in your family, what happens to you? Would you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and go get a job? No. Being able to feed yourself or clothe yourself or have anything was totally dependent on that you had a male to take care of you. And so when these 
three males die, it's just not a loss of your husbands and your sons. It's a loss of anything financial or being able to eat. And so they, here they are on this road, and Orpah goes back, and Ruth says to Naomi, where you are, I will go. I will not leave your side. And I'm thinking about places and times where I have been on the road like Naomi. Have you ever had that feeling where the rug just gets pulled out from underneath you? And in a second or a moment, or maybe you even know it's coming, but you, it's like a gut punch, and you're not even sure what the next step is, and you're not even sure how you're going to get there, or what's the smart thing, or it's just those moments in your life where you're not sure, God, where are you? Those things that happen in our lives when we feel like Naomi on the road and we have no idea what is next. And in your brains, you can probably think of those things. And someone comes and stands beside you and says, you are not alone. And not only are you not alone, but you have a God that walks with you, that reminds you of that promise. It was my last semester of seminary, um, so I had Eli in November, my oldest child, and then I had, a sem- I had to finish off that semester, and I had a semester left of school. And I was able to take some J-term stuff, and my husband Eric still had to work, so usually I tried to get my classes done in the morning and get some work in, because we were not the richest people in the world, if you can about imagine, right? So you're getting classes done, and then um, Eric went to work, and there were still some classes that last semester that were in the afternoon. So I was trying to figure out how I'm going to do this with this baby, right? My first child. And a few of them, I could take him to class with me, and they would just pass him around the class until he pooped his diaper, and then they would pass him back to me to go change him. And so that worked out well, right? He, he's already got some Bible in him. He's been to Genesis, to Revelation, and, and all that stuff. So that worked. But there were other classes that were harder. And I hit that wall that semester, and I thought, I'm not going to be able to graduate with my class. This isn't going to work. And I said to my classmates, I said, guys, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to graduate with you. And do you know what they said to me? I was having a crisis moment. It wasn't that calm, trust me. And they said, we've got you. What hours do you need? I don't know how to change a diaper, but I can figure it out, right? We'll take the baby. We've got this. We are doing this together, and you don't have a choice we're going to support you. And we did. We did it together. We got through it. They learned how to change a diaper and take care of a baby, and I got classes done. And we all graduated together. There's those moments in life where you just don't know the next, and someone comes up beside you and says, either I will sit with you, and I will love you, and I will remind you of whose you are, and how important you are, and I will walk with you. And then there's moments in our lives where we get to be the Ruth, right? Where we get to see people in need, and we get to say, you are not alone, and I am yours. And and this God doesn't just walk away from you, and things will get better. What happens in Ruth's story? Do they just stay on the road? They move. They go, and Boaz is there, and all of this fulfillment, and they go from sadness and tragedy to joy. And God is there working in the midst. Community, we are built, and God created us to be in community, to need one another. It is a gift. Now, with that being said, How many of you during this time have maybe had a little bit too much community with your family, right? 
Community is not perfect, because we are not perfect. How many of you have maybe been together a little bit too long and maybe said things that you wouldn't otherwise have said that maybe weren't okay? Right? Community is hard. And I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but how many of you have had relationships that maybe are broken and need to be mended or places um, where we struggle or there's hurt feelings and people that maybe we're not talking to anymore? Being in relationship and being in community is important and a gift from God, but that does not equal easy. And God reminds us how important it is to have that. Have you ever driven home at the end of the day and said, I'm done peopling? I just need to not be around people. Like, all people are crazy or all the words that go through you, right? Sometimes we feel like if I could just be in my bubble and not around people, it'd be easier, right? Have you ever thought those feelings to yourself? I thought that last night. I was here all day and and all the neighbors were out and I thought, I'm going to stay in my house and I don't need to do people anymore. And then I looked outside and they looked like they were having a lot of fun. So I was a little lonely and all of a sudden I'm out there with them. The thing about community, too, is that if we don't have it, the opposite of that is what? Loneliness. What have we been hearing the last few months? Loneliness is not good either. So in the midst of doing the hard work of being community together, And knowing as we gather in this place that we're able to see each other and be together, whether we're able to be online and be able to interact with one another, to care for those around us, however we can be community together, we're learning what that means. God created us to walk with one another. So I am grateful for all of you. I'm grateful that we get to be community as a Gloria Day, that we get to be filled up and we get to support one another, that we get to support this community as we do mission work, and that we get to go and be community in our works, in our families, in our relationships, and we get to remind each other that you are a child of God now and forever, forgiven and loved and set free, free to go and care for those around you. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, that we know that as we gather as this community, that you have forgiven our sins, that you continue to wash us anew in the waters of our baptism, and that you set us free. Help us to go out into this world to share that love and that message with others and to care for those around us. We ask this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.